Hey, there we go. Serverside development and rock and roll. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. Oh. Morning, everyone. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. My turn to talk now. Okay. Time for software. Can you hear me? I'm going to start. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this is uh, going to be way more dev than ops, but I still hope I'm going to provide some uh, insights. So machine-to-machine -machine communication is crucial in any kind of distributed system, but it can also be quite annoying. If your HTTP server responds with I'm a teapot, that's RFC compliant, but nevertheless pretty useless to almost all callers. So, joking aside, many callers are actually better off by not asking for any kind of response and saving the effort of processing it. And this is one of the things AMQP, or in general asynchronous messaging, allows you to do. So, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to show you how to improve the maintainability and stability of your overall system by adding asynchronous communication to the mix. I'm going to start with some of the disadvantages of synchronous communication, introduce you to the advanced message queuing protocol, and highlight its two main use cases, which are based on the publish subscribe pattern and the task queue. And I'm finally going to wrap it up. So let's start with synchronous communication. If one of your business partners goes out of business, you are going to update their record in your business partner's application. But unfortunately, this is not sufficient. You want to cancel their pending orders and put their support contracts on hold. So the client applications in charge of orders and support contracts have to learn about the update. You can use a REST API to inform them, but unfortunately, this has some disadvantages. If one of the client applications is temporarily down, the REST request is going to hit a timeout, and when the application is back, it has missed the important information. If you add a new application to your system, it has to learn about your business partner being broke as well. And this means you have to touch your business partner's application's code and modify it to ensure it's going to make an additional REST request to inform the new component. So the business partner's application has to be aware of all its clients, giving you a rather tight coupling of your components. Basically because HTTP is routing one-to-one, -one, while what you would prefer to have here is a one-to-n routing. And this issue is not restricted to e-commerce. I'm working for Xing.com. We are a business network, a social networking site for business professionals, that way. And we have similar issues to tackle. If a user changes, for example, their job title, we update their record in our profiles application. But many other applications are working with their data as well. For example, our events application has to deal with job titles in order to render a proper list of event attendees. So it's caching this data, which also means it has to learn about updates in order to invalidate the cache accordingly. As I've shown you in the previous example, a REST API has some disadvantages in this setup, which is why we don't use it here. But we use asynchronous messaging instead. To be more specific, we rely on the advanced message queuing protocol. If you type this into the search engine of your choice, you're probably going to end up on mqp.org. And this is telling you about a capable commoditized multi-vendor communications ecosystem, creating opportunities for commerce and innovation, transforming the way business is done. So basically, it's a tool for world domination on the internet and beware, even in the cloud. So bingo. Wikipedia has a much more useful message for us about an open standard protocol for a message-oriented middleware. So this middleware is called a message broker, and it's basically a daemon connecting producers and consumers of messages. MQP is a wire-level protocol, 
So all it does is define a data format, and every client compatible with this format, every client providing that format is compatible. So you can easily glue together components that are based on totally different technology stacks, irrespective of the implementation. A message contains a routing key, which is used to ensure that the message is routed to the correct consumers. And a payload, that's your application data. It can be anything you want. In our case, it's text formatted as JSON. That's basically because we're dealing with web applications and web applications like the JSON format. If a producer application wants to publish a message, it's connecting to the message broker and dropping the message into the so-called exchange. The exchange is in charge of the routing. It copies the message into one or several message queues from where it is consumed by the consumer application. The producer of the message doesn't get any kind of response from the consumer. It doesn't even have to be aware of the consumer's existence. It drops the message and immediately moves on to other tasks. So you get a nice decoupling of your services. Now, in practice, the world is a bit more complicated. You probably have several message producers publishing messages into multiple exchanges, which have bindings to multiple queues. And even a queue can be consumed by multiple message consumers. So this is a very simplified picture. But I hope it's giving you some idea about the message flow. If the consumer application is temporarily down, the messages are going to stay in the queue, and when the message is back, it can, con not the message, sorry, when the consumer is back, it can continue to consume those messages. So no information is getting lost during a temporary consumer downtime. When it comes to creation of exchanges and queues and the bindings between them, your applications are in charge. You do not have to mess around with a broker configuration. Your application code can create exchanges, messages, and queues. And that basically means that a new service can connect itself to the system. So a new consumer application simply connects to the broker, creates the queue it wants to use, binds it to the exchange accordingly, and it can start receiving messages. Now, every message published by the producer application is copied into both message queues, ending up in both consumer applications. And the producer is not aware of the new consumer. It doesn't have to know anything about its clients, its consumers. So you don't have to touch the producer's code. Now, the consumer application can add itself to the system which means it can basically subscribe to messages it's interested in. So we have some publish-subscribe pattern here. Now, different consumers might be interested in different information. And in order to cater to those different needs, you can use different messages with different routing keys and different payloads. I have some examples for you. So we have a message with a routing key that ends in user deleted. I just cut off the first part of the routing key because it's not uh, relevant here. And we publish this message whenever a user removes their account from our platform. Basically, all our applications subscribe to this message. So they learn about removed accounts and can clean up all the data they have associated with this user. We send a different message with the routing key profile updated. And this is published if a user updates their core profile data, like their job title, the profile picture, and so on. And every application that's caching this data subscribes to this message and learns when it has to invalidate the cache. Now, some of our applications do not only cache this data, they maintain a full mirror. And those applications 
actually need the new updated data in order to update the mirror. So it's not sufficient for those apps to learn that an update has happened. They need the new data. So why don't we include it into the message payload? Well, this is basically our way to embrace the fact that we're dealing with a distributed system. There is no guarantee about the order of messages. If a user updates the same field several times in a row, the last message we receive is not necessarily the one that's coming from the most recent update. So if we include the updated data, it might already be outdated upon arrival of the message. So if there is no guarantee about the order, commutativity is the best you can do, and that's basically what we reach by omitting the updated data and just sending the list of fields that have changed. Now, if an application mirrors this data, it still needs the new updated data, which is why we complement our messaging infrastructure with some internal REST API that is always providing the most recent data. It's our leading system. And a message consumer interested in the new updated data has to follow up with a REST request in order to fetch it. As a side effect, it helps us to keep our payload small, which is easier on the broker if you have a lot of messages. So there is no guaranteed order of messages, but there is also no such thing as exactly once delivery. If a message producer is recovering from a connection failure, it may or may not be able to figure out if a previously sent message has made it to the broker or not. So in order to ensure at least once delivery, a well-behaved message producer has to publish the message again, which might result in duplicated messages. So whenever possible, we try to implement our message consumers in an idempotent way. So far, I've talked a lot about message consumers, subscribing to messages, adding themselves to the system. But what about producers? A producer can also add itself to the system by connecting to the broker and starting to drop messages into the exchange. Now, it might drop messages with the same routing key as the existing producer, and messages from both of them are now routed to the same message queue, ending up in the very same consumer. And the consumer, again, doesn't have to know anything about the new producer. You do not have to touch the consumer's code. A use case for this setup is tracking. We used to consume a very expensive third-party API, and we wanted to track that usage. Now it was happening all over the place in many different of our services. Of course, you can implement tracking into each and every application, but this leaves you with the annoying task to combine all that data. So what we did instead is to turn all those applications into message producers. Whenever an application connected to the third party, it published an AMQP message about it. And we've routed all those messages from all those different applications to the same message queue so that they ended up in the same consumer, which basically incremented a counter, giving us a nice and centralized tracking of something that was happening all over the place. This, of course, is not idempotent, but we were only interested in the order of magnitude. We didn't care about the exact numbers, so it was definitely good enough. So in this example, we have multiple publishers publishing messages that are routed to one consumer. In the previous example, we had one publisher, the owner of the data, publishing messages to multiple consumers, basically all the applications caching that data. And technically, you can also route messages end to M from multiple producers to multiple consumers. But you should think twice if you really want to do that. So your message payload is as much of an API as a REST response. And sooner or later, you have to do a breaking change. 
this can be very hard to coordinate if you have to deal with multiple producers and multiple consumers at the same time. Also in our experience, the business logic is often represented much better by having several independent different messages, some routed one to n, some routed n to one, covering dis different aspects of the business logic, instead of having this one super message covering everything going from multiple publishers to multiple consumers. So the messages we've seen so far are basically notifications. Something happens in the publisher, in the producer application, and it publishes a message about it to inform other applications. You can turn this upside down by sending a so-called command message, where the publisher sends the message in order to ask the consumer application to do something on their behalf. And this turns your message queue into a task queue. And the most straightforward use case for a task queue is to run tasks asynchronously. So if a user uploads a new profile picture to our platform, we have to process this image file, create thumbnails in different sizes, upload them to a cluster of asset servers, and this is very time consuming. It takes way too long to make the user wait for that. So we don't. Our user-facing request just stores the image, publishes an MQP message about it, and immediately returns to the user, informing them that their image is going to be processed. Now, the message is consumed by the actual image processing service, which is doing all the heavy lifting. This is a very common pattern in web development. A user-facing request that is doing nearly nothing except for publishing a message, and a message consumer that is a back-end service doing the actual task. So this obviously helps you to improve your response time because your user-facing request is doing nearly nothing, so it's returning very quickly. But it can also help you to avoid downtimes. A downtime of our image processing service is no longer a user-facing downtime. The messages are going to stay in the queue, the users can continue to upload new images, and when the image processing service is back, it is continuing to process the messages, which means it can continue to process the images. Now, if we put this image processing service on a dedicated machine that is doing nothing except for this image processing, we can decouple our components even more. So if there is a sudden spike in image uploads, the only thing that's going to slow down is the processing of other uploaded images, while the rest of our platform is not affected at all. Now, if we still feel that our image processing is getting too slow, we can scale the system on the fly by adding additional identical consumer instances. Now, the messages are load balanced between the consumers, which basically means we can process several messages in parallel. The consumer code is still the same, it's very simple. Your consumer code is not aware of being run asynchronously, it's not aware of being run in parallel. All it has to know is how to handle one message at a time. In our example, that means how to handle one image at a time. So there is no functional programming or any advanced uh, programming technique whatsoever required here. You can keep your code very simple. So this scaling technique is useful if you are dealing with time-consuming tasks, but it's also helpful if there is a task you need to repeat many, many times. For example, if we have to migrate our users or some of their data to a new data format. So we can write a script that's migrating one user after the other. But given that we have millions of users, it's going to take very long. 
And that means we have to babysit it. It's going to crash, we have to restart it, make sure it picks up where it crashed, and so on. So we prefer to avoid that, and what we can do instead is write a very lean migration trigger, which is not migrating anything, it's just selecting the users to be migrated and publishing an AMQP message for every such user. This script is finishing quickly, so it doesn't require a lot of babysitting. And the messages are routed to consumers, which are doing the actual data migration. And if we set up multiple consumer instances, this migration is going to happen in parallel. This is a useful approach if you are trying to replace a part of your system with a new implementation and you want to pre-fill this new system with data. We have recently changed the format of the profile pictures of our users from rectangular to squared. So we needed to create squared images for all our existing users. We used this approach for that. And that allowed us to do it without any kind of downtime. The users were still using the old implementation. They were still uploading images. But whenever a user uploaded an image to the old system, we published the migration AMQP message. So this user ended up in our migration queue again, making sure that at the end, we had images in the new format based on the user's most recent upload. If you're replacing part of your system with a new implementation, you want to test that. A while ago, we have replaced the part of our platform that is handling the user's CV. This is a core part of our business, and it's receiving a lot of traffic. But unfortunately, the old implementation and the data behind it is up to 10 years old. So there is a lot of edge cases in the data, and trying to cover all that with test cases is basically impossible. So we use the shadow calls instead. Whenever a user requested such a CV, we have routed the request to the old implementation and published an AMQP message about that request. A consumer receiving those messages followed up by making a shadow call to the new implementation. So the consumer made the very same request our production system received to the new implementation. And if the new implementation was not able to handle such a request, we would find something in our logging or monitoring system and could fix this bug even before going live with our new system. The users didn't notice anything because they were still served from the old implementation. This is also a nice way to test if your new implementation can actually stand all the traffic it's going to receive. So in the beginning, we dropped most of the AMQP messages. And then we slowly increased the percentage of messages resulting in a shadow call over time until we reached 100%, which basically meant our new implementation was receiving all the traffic our live system received. And we were observing that very closely so that we could feel very confident when finally going live with the new implementation. Okay, to wrap it up, MQP allows you to easily glue together components that are based on totally different technology stacks. It helps you to improve your response times by decoupling the user-facing requests from some time-consuming backend services. It helps you to avoid downtimes because the downtime of your backend service is no longer a user-facing downtime. You can scale the system on the fly by adding additional consumer instances to a queue. So all of that helps you to reduce the complexity of your overall system 
and it helps you to keep your code very simple. Your consumer code is not aware of being run asynchronously, it is not aware of being run in parallel, it only has to know how to process one message at a time. So that's keeping it very simple. Getting started with AMQP is very easy. We basically have client implementations for sending and receiving messages available in all programming languages. And if you do not want to run your own broker, you can start using a cloud service for that. So it's easy to get started and I suggest you can try that out and decouple all your things. Thank you very much.